I would like to start first uh, by fixing the mic. Uh, I would like to start first uh, by thanking the organization, the organizer, the organizing committee, for inviting me here, and uh, by acknowledging uh, the people who worked with me in the Weizmann Institute and uh, the ERC founding. It's fun to be rich. And uh, I'm going uh, today, I'm going to change completely the subject and I'm going to tell you a strange story with, uh, I think, a happy end. So I'm going uh, to talk about uh, uh, cloud aerosol interactions, convective cloud aerosol interactions, and um, I'm going to focus on invigoration. So I guess that uh, every one of you knows how important clouds are, and uh, uh, you know also about the indirect effect of aerosols and the first, the second, the third, the end, the semi-direct effect, fast feedback, slow feedbacks, all these words that uh, confuse us. Invigoration is the most elusive one. If it's true, it can be uh, one of the most important effects, but since invigoration is on the link between aerosol and convective clouds, and measuring aerosol in the vicinity of clouds is bad, especially if you measure aerosol in the vicinity of convective clouds, uh, there are many contradicting evidences, both from modeling and from, uh, uh, from measurements, as if aerosol really exists, if, sorry, if invigoration really exists, and uh, if not, what is the reason that we see such trends? So this is the baseline for my story. What is invigoration? Invigoration uh, basically links uh, aerosol to enhancement of uh, convective clouds. So more aerosol, deeper clouds, larger cloud fraction. And uh, most studies that offered invigoration or suggested invigoration were focused on deep convection over the tropics, over Brazil, over the mid-latitude, over land, over ocean, but deep convective with uh, mix and ice phase. And uh, just to briefly go on the history of invigoration, uh, invigoration was shown by in situ measurement over the Amazon during the smoke campaign with uh, Andrea Rosenfeld, Paolo was there, and they showed from measurement how uh, uh, smoke can narrow the size distribution, delay rain, and make the clouds larger. Then uh, invigoration was shown using satellite data all over the Atlantic, showing that uh, if you take larger AUD, the clouds would be uh, taller, deeper, and uh, you can see the Tumi effect per each given pressure level, which is a kind of a challenge, because when you deal with convective clouds, it's very hard to see the Tumi effect. Later on, it was also suggested that uh, it will have a very uh, important effect on rain, especially rain rate. So it was suggested with a lot of criticism that uh, invigorated cloud dip, uh, convective clouds that will be invigorated will delay the rain, but once the rain will start, it will be a larger, more, a larger rates, more violent, uh, stronger rain rates. And uh, there is a study that shows that almost all over the dream area, we can see positive correlation between aerosol and rain rates. We have to remember that uh, invigoration poses a challenge on the radiative effect because uh, it, it becomes much richer question when you are pushing cl your clouds to be higher, you may move to a uh, from a regime of cooling to a regime of warming. We have to remember that taller clouds have a stronger long wave uh, or greenhouse component. So 
This is a, a plot that show uh, on the x-axis the cloud optical thickness and on the y-axis the uh, cloud top. And you can see that if you push your clouds to be taller or you push the clouds to be with less optical thickness, you move from cooling to warming. So the overall effect of invigoration can be very different in different places. Depends on the type of convective clouds. And we have to take into account anvils. So if you push your clouds to be taller and higher, you may reach area with stronger wind shear. And then you can have uh, uh, much larger anvils. And anvils known to be warming components. Okay, so what about convective cl uh, warm convective clouds? With warm convective clouds, it is even more interesting. So uh, collecting studies, there are not many studies that uh, deal with warm convective clouds, but uh, some studies uh, suggest that yes, there is cloud invigoration in warm convective clouds, and other studies show the other way around. So they show that uh, warm convective clouds that form under polluted condition can uh, have, uh, will be smaller, will be last uh, for shorter times, will precipitate less. And uh, do you see a pattern between the studies that show invigoration and studies this, that show suppression? If you are not uh, familiar with the people, uh, those who show suppressions are modelers, <laughs> and those who show uh, invigorations, they do observations. So we have a, a very interesting soup of ideas. The, the modelers, yes. This is what happened when you look on Google when you type modelers. This is what you get. <laughs> anyway, so. Invigoration, does it exist? If it exists, does it exist only for deep convective clouds? Do we need, do we have to have the transition to a uh, mix and cold phase? And then the explanation is that because of uh, polluted clouds are uh, less efficient to freeze, and then they freeze on colder temperature, and then they release the latent heat on higher levels of the atmosphere, and this is the invigoration. But basically, there are many, many reasons to see or to think that invigoration should exist on warm convective clouds. And uh, then those who say that invigoration does not exist and it's only our imagination, they disagree among themselves uh, of what is the reason that it does not exist. Some says that it's cloud contamination and uh, the aerosol that we measure in the vicinity of clouds is just uh, the, we, we measure higher level because of cloud contamination, because of humidifi humidification, because of 3D effects. Others says that no, we do measure correlations, but the correlations are not cause and effect. It's meteorology. So the same meteorology that prefer deep convective, deeper convective clouds prefer a, a larger concentration of aerosols. And no matter how we tortured the data, we always see invigoration. So we try to slice it for meteorology. We try to find really nice cases with no cloud contamination. I don't have time to, to, to talk about it now, but I will be happy to answer questions. So we are focusing now, from now on, on warm convective clouds and uh, mostly on two papers. One that was published already a few months ago and one that is currently in uh, ACPD with a detailed modeling study. So, first of all, our area of study and uh, selecting the right area of study was really great part of uh, our uh, 
our, our work. So do you see these squares? And the squares are, we, we thought that if you want to uh, study aerosol effect on uh, convective clouds, go to the unsaturated area. Don't go to places where the aerosol concentration is high and the microphysics effect can be already saturated. Go to places where clouds are aerosol limited. And then you can think about uh, a theoretical exercise. Uh, say that we have uh, atmosphere, atmospheric condition that allow for a convective, warm convective cloud to form, and there are no aerosol in this atmosphere. There will be no cloud. Everybody agree that there will be no cloud. And then say that we have only five particles per cubic centimeter. Now people start to agree that uh, yeah, the cloud would be very poor because we will not have surface area for condensation and the individual, individual droplets would be large and they will fall faster and it will be a very poor cloud. And then we move from five particles to 50 and the cloud would be happier. The question is when do clouds stop being aerosol limited? And our point is that Really, deep inside, invigoration and cloud and aerosol limited clouds is the same. And our point is that clouds can enjoy aerosols in much larger concentration. Enjoy, I mean, being vigo, large, happy, live longer. So we are going to places that are extremely clean. The winds are relatively weak. This is called this area called the horses latitude. Horses because uh, uh, the sailors had to throw out uh, their cargo in order to move. It's between the uh, trade winds and the mid latitude winds, and it's quite stagnant. And these are the most the, the most clean places with respect to aerosol that we could find. And to make a long story short, let me show you observations. So uh, it's a very loaded plot, but basically you can see that if we look on rain, on cloud top pressure, on cloud top pressure, uh, temperature, which is indication for the thickness of the cloud, and on cloud fraction, we can see positive correlation between AOD and these numbers. And no matter how we torture the data, and in the su uh, supplementary uh, information, we tortured the data due to the reviewers, we, it's, it's, it's really cruel. We always got the same correlations. We couldn't kill the invigoration. Now, what's so special about this area? This area are with if you look on the, on, the, on the thermodynamic profile, there is a potential for a convective cloud. And not a puffy cumulus. It can be quite deep convective cloud. But when you look on the data, the clouds are relatively poor. And their uh, cloud fraction is relatively small. This is great, because then you cannot blame cloud contamination. Okay? You have enough real estate clean from clouds far from clouds to get your A AOD right. So there are many advantages going there. And you can see the results. And uh, due to the uh, reviewer's suggestions, they wanted us to look on serious data. And this was a great idea. Because here we get a textbook uh, plot on cloud and radiation. So what do we see? Uh, for, for those who are not familiar, serious data measure top of the atmosphere fluxes in the short wave and in the long wave. And they have a product that uh, is called all data. So it doesn't care if it's cloud or cloud free. They measure fluxes. So on the left uh, column, we see the short wave. And you see that we didn't tell series if it's a cloud or a cloud free. We just sorted the data according to the AOD. And you can see huge forcing. You, you can see uh, many tens of watt per meter square correlating with the AOD. But how do we know that it's cloud? Maybe it's aerosol. Well, aerosol cannot, in such low concentration, cannot create such forcing. So it's not aerosol. But to get it even more nice, if you look on the uh, long wave, you see compensating effect, meaning that the clouds are becoming taller. 
So all in all, we see uh, more than 10 watts uh, per meter square, 15 watts per meter square forcing correlating with shifting in one aerosol unit. Okay, so now we move to the model and we used a toy but clever model and uh, I think that uh, to call a model toy is a compliment in our days. So uh, I'm saying toy Wow, okay. I'm saying toy to give it a compliment. It means that we simplify whatever we could and we leave the juicy part inside. And I have to run, but we took whatever we could from the ODs and the PDs that describe cloud evolution and each and every component of the equation we followed in time. And we, I will not be able to go through these keywords. I prepared probably a talk for an hour, but let me show you the exercise that we did. We did, we took three levels of inversion. And so we have uh, clouds that their inversion is six kilometers, four kilometers, and two kilometers. And for each cloud, for each cloud, we change the relative humidity of the surrounding. Why relative humidity? Because relative humidity is the fuel for entrainment. And entrainment is the non-adiabatic component, the mixing with the dry air. And this is a huge component. This is the second most important component. So we have core and we have periphery. And there is always a competition between what is happening in the core and what is happening in the entrainment zone. Let me go fast through the results. So here you see the total mass of the cloud, total integrated amount of water. And the, the take home message is that you, you, I think that is quite clear that you see a maxima. So the x axis is aerosol concentration and the y axis is the maxima. And you see that there is an optimum concentration. And this optimal concentration depends on the profile and depends on the relative humidity. So it depends on how thick, what is the thermodynamic potential of your cloud is, and what is the relative humidity of the surrounding, the fuel for entrainment. So thicker cloud with larger uh, relative humidity would enjoy much larger concentration of aerosol. They would use it as a core processes for invigoration. Poorer cloud, the ratio between periphery to core is much larger, and entrainment will take over much earlier. We did it for um, many different variables, and uh, one of the key components that we could see is delay. So delay is a key component of the story. Delay means take the maximum in condensation, and take the maximum in collision coalescence. So the flux that move uh, droplets from smaller to larger within the same grid box. And you see that aerosol concentration control, control this delay. OK, I'm running. So this is the delay. And we can see a very nice, clean delay correlating with the uh, amount of aerosol, but depends also on the thick potential of the cloud. And I want to summarize. So if you have thermodynamic potential for a cloud to be thicker, to be happy, to be six kilometer warm clouds, warm cloud, it will not always reach there. It, it will not always get to the inversion. Basically, on lower aerosol concentration, it will be aerosol limited. And you add more aerosol, it will be thicker, it will be uh, wider, it will have larger cloud fraction. However, if your thermodynamic condition or the relative humidity surrounding the cloud is smaller, the potential for cloud to enjoy uh, the, the, the aerosol concentration is smaller. The uh, optimal concentration will be smaller. And of course, if you go to trade cumulus, it would be even much smaller. And if you take these results together with the observation, 
together with the modeling, actually you get a very nice explanation for the uh, question that I asked before. Why do we see such discrepancies between warm cloud modeling and warm cloud observation? Well, the answer is here. When we are running a modeling, and I'm also a modeler, so half of me is a modeler and half of me do observation. When I'm running a modeling, I have a CPU problem. I want my grid box to be 25 meters. So I'm running, I'm biased to smaller clouds. I have no choice. I need a grid box that can support, that my computer can support it. And I need microphysics, being microphysics, it's very expensive. However, if you look on MODIS, the, 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 the pixel resolution is one kilometer. And we will not retrieve one kilometer cloud, we will retrieve minimum four kilometer cloud. So uh, MODIS or observations are generally biased to larger warm convective clouds. So they see the invigoration branch of the story, and models are biased to smaller trade cumulus clouds, and they see the suppression. And I think that we offer a kind of a closure, and thank you very much. Thank you.